The previous three chapters have been building up to this. Elements, molecules, water, carbon, functional groups. Now we're going to put them all together to start building cells. This chapter is a big girl, so we're going to take it in two pieces. Learning objectives for part one, here and here. The molecules of life are large, relatively speaking. They can be thousands, millions, or even billions of Daltons in size. But life is ordered and organized at all levels, from the atoms on up to the entire biosphere. The majority of the molecules in a cell fall into four classes. In this lecture, I'll introduce the general pattern of building and unbuilding of large molecules, and then we'll get into the structure and function of the first two on the list, carbohydrates and lipids. The astrophysicist Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson has said, what is biology if not the most complex expression of chemistry that we know? Three of the four types of macromolecules are polymeric, meaning they're built up from long chains of similar building blocks. Polymer means many parts, and the single units are called monomers. We can put the single parts together into two-part dimers or three-part trimers, and just like in English, we have a word that means a few, meaning not one or two, and not a lot. That prefix in Greek is oligo, so an oligomer is a chain of a few monomers. Building up and breaking down polymers doesn't just happen. There are molecular tools called enzymes that make it happen. These enzymes are made of one of our classes of large biomolecules, proteins. Check out this colorful ribbon model of an enzyme. Doesn't that look like fun? More on this in part two of this chapter and later on in chapter eight. While the four types of large biological molecules have different enzymes to build them up and break them down, there's a pattern to it. Building up is done by dehydration synthesis. When someone is dehydrated, they need to consume water. This happened to me once, and I'll tell you that story in chapter seven. But when something is dehydrated, like grapes to make raisins, water is removed. And this second type of dehydration is what you should think about in polymer synthesis. As we add monomers, represented by these purple circles, to a growing polymer chain, the enzymes form a covalent bond, and in doing so, remove a hydrogen atom and a hydroxyl group to produce a molecule of water and a longer polymer. To break off the monomers from the polymer, like when we digest our food to make new human biomass, we do the opposite. Enzymes break a molecule of water and add a proton and hydroxide ion to the ends of the monomer and the shrinking polymer. This is called hydrolysis, which means water breaking. Within a cell, there are thousands of different macromolecules providing structure and function to the cell. In large multicellular organisms, such as you and I, different types of cells produce different types of macromolecules. And different species increase the total variability of all macromolecules within the biosphere. However, the components that generate that chemical diversity are built from surprisingly few types of monomers. It's kind of like our alphabet of 26 letters, which can be used to write a science textbook or a short text to a friend or a limerick or your favorite novel. The first class of biological molecules for us to consider are the carbohydrates. Not to be confused with the hydrocarbons, which are just hydrogen and carbon. Think of the carbohydrates as being carbon that is hydrated, like with water. Carbohydrates include the many simple sugars and polymers built up from them. Table sugar is a disaccharide made of two simpler monosaccharides. Sugars are typically mono or disaccharides. Monosaccharides have the generalized formula CH2O repeated some number of times, which is where the name carbohydrate comes from. It is, in a way, hydrated carbon or carbon plus water. Glucose is the most common monosaccharide, though there are plenty of others. A defining feature of carbohydrates is the presence of two functional groups a carbonyl group, and some hydroxyl groups, all attached to a carbon skeleton. This table shows how we can categorize sugars based on whether their carbonyl group is terminal, forming an aldehyde group, 
also known as an aldose or an aldehyde sugar. Or there's an internal carbonyl group, a ketone, called a ketose or a ketone sugar. See if you can find the carbonyl groups in all these sugars. The rows show how the number of carbons in the skeleton can also be used to categorize sugars. Three carbon sugars make a triose, five a pentose, and six a hexose. So if I were to ask you to describe glucose, which is down here, you might say it's an aldose and a hexose. Something else to note on this table, glucose and galactose. They look like they're exactly the same, but they are not. See that purple box there on carbon four? In two dimensions of the screen, it might look like no big deal. But remembering that chemistry is three dimensional, it is a big deal. Galactose, glucose, and fructose are all structural isomers. If I said, hey, I need some C6H12O6, you wouldn't know which of these I meant. Or there are other possible structural isomers as well as potential enantiomers. So these seven monosaccharides are not the only ones that are out there. There are others, but these seven are important, wink, because we'll be seeing them again this semester. I'm not going to ask you to memorize their structures, but saying their names out loud one or two times will help you to remember them when we talk about glycolysis in chapter 9, photosynthesis in chapter 10, and nucleic acids in this chapter and in chapters 16 and 17 especially. Glyceraldehyde, dihydroxyacetone, ribose, ribulose, fructose, and these two I believe you've already met. The drawings you've just encountered have linear skeletons. In aqueous solutions, which are the usual case found in cells, monosaccharides form rings. For the rest of this chapter and probably the semester, whenever you see a green hexagon like this, think glucose. While glucose is the most common sugar in nature, the sugar you buy at the store is sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide of two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. Maltose is a disaccharide of two glucose molecules. Lactose, which you may have already heard of, is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose. Note how the monosaccharides in these three disaccharides are covalently joined together by an oxygen atom. This junction, with all of its strange molecular poppings and lockings, is called a glycosidic linkage. It is these linkages that lead to a condition commonly known as lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is a medical condition caused by an inadequate supply of the enzyme that hydrolyzes that glycosidic linkage. If you get a tummy ache from eating ice cream or cheese or drinking cow's milk, you may have this condition. It's very common, with the prevalence as high as 75% or higher in some populations. Fun fact I recently learned, there's also such a thing as sucrose intolerance. It's much more rare, typically less than 1% of a population, though in Inuit populations, the rate often goes as high as 5 or 10%. Reminder that building up of biomolecules is by dehydration reactions and breaking down by hydrolysis. In this side, we see the making of a glycosidic linkage and the removal of an OH and an H to make a molecule of water and form the glycosidic linkage. Also, note that maltose and sucrose have glycosidic linkages that are not quite identical. In maltose, it's a 1,4 glycosidic linkage because carbon-4 of one glucose molecule is attached to carbon-1 of the other glucose molecule. In sucrose, it is a 1,2 glycosidic linkage. While there are relatively few monomers, we are already seeing how tying them together differently can give us different immersion properties. So if the function of carbohydrates is not to fill the deep well of sadness, what is their function? Why do they exist? Simple sugars are used for cellular fuel, which we'll get into in Unit 2. 
but certain monosaccharides have an important structural function that we'll see at the end of this chapter. But two saccharides don't make a polysaccharide, just like two people don't make much of a conga line. Polysaccharides, also known as complex carbohydrates, are not like the sweet little things we've just been talking about. Polysaccharides have two main functions. One is the storage of the simple carbohydrates. Plants are great makers of sugar thanks to the process of photosynthesis, which is in chapter 10. They are so good at it, they produce great surpluses, which they need to store away until they need it. Maybe in winter when they don't have any leaves and not much sun. Or they want to store it away in seeds so that baby plants can use it for energy before the baby plants can start photosynthesizing on their own. However, this storage can be short or long term, but it is not meant to be undoable, i.e. it's not meant to be permanent. Plants achieve this by storing the glucose monomers with glycosidic linkages that produce a helical polysaccharide. In general, these helical molecules are called starches, and they are stored in specialized organelles called plastids. Here we can see a cartoon of amylose up on the top, which is a simple form of starch, such as you might see in that very useful vegetable, the potato. When not mashed, french fried, or chipped, potatoes serve as an underground fuel storage for the potato plant, which is native to the Andes Mountains of South America. As you can see, the hexagons of glucose form these spiral helices that are easily hydrolyzed back to glucose. We animals also have a way of storing glucose when it is abundant. We animals also have a way of storing glucose when it is abundant, and you can see that the shape of the polymer is a lot like starch, helical. We don't photosynthesize, so we don't produce large stores of glycogen. We cycle through it pretty quickly. How quickly? Well, how many days do you go without eating? If you're like me, you eat every day that you can, which is to say, every day, a couple of times. If we try to pack away glycogen too much, our body stores the fuel in another form, which we'll get to in a few slides. A third type of polysaccharide is not like the others. Notice how the shape has changed from helical to linear. The green hexagons, glucose, are pretty much the same. The structure is related to the function. Unlike starch and glycogen, which store glucose for later, cellulose is a building material. It is meant to be permanent. Cellulose is not produced by animals. Mostly is produced by plants, and plants produce an awful lot of it. Cellulose makes up the cell walls of plants, which gives them stiffness. The glycosidic linkages are what make cellulose and starch so different, and the different linkages arise from glucose being able to form rings in two different ways, called alpha and beta. Alpha and beta are the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, as well as being the sources for our English word, alphabet. Both alpha and beta glucose start off in the linear form, but you can, just like you can fold a sheet of paper lengthwise or breadthwise, the same glucose molecule can form an alpha ring here on the left, or a beta ring here on the right. See that hydroxyl group in blue? That's the difference maker right there. In starch, the alpha linkages are all facing one way. In cellulose, they alternate up and down, up and down. And the alternating up-down makes the chain of glucose residues straight. It also allows those straight chains to hydrogen bond to each other and that leads to the production of straight microfibrils and straight cellulose fibers that we can see under a microscope. This is like a rope that is made of tiny fibers spun into yarns and the yarns twisted into strands, except that the fibers are all straight and held together with hydrogen bonds. So while starch is fairly easy to digest, cellulose is not. The function of starch is to be broken down into glucose fuel when it is needed. Cellulose is made to stay put. We take advantage of this on a regular basis. Cellulose is the most abundant polysaccharide in the world, considering that it makes up the structure surrounding most plant cells. Cellulose is all around you, quite literally. 
Cotton is produced from cellulose fibers. Paper is produced from cellulose fibers. Wood is a mix of cellulose and another polymer called lignin. We can eat cellulose, but we need other nutrients as well. When we eat cellulose, most of it passes undigested as fiber. Fiber in the diet is good because it abrades or rubs the intestinal walls, which makes the intestines secrete mucus, which smooths um, things out. We are not good at breaking down cellulose. Very few living things are good at breaking down cellulose, and most of them are microbes, bacteria, fungi, and protists. If cows didn't have a little help from their friends, or rather a lot of help from their little friends living in their guts, they'd starve. Speaking of termites and other little friends, one more example of a polysaccharide. This, again, is a structural polysaccharide. It is called chitin, and I can often tell who hasn't been watching my lecture videos because they'll call it chitin. But no, it's chitin. Chitin is strange in that we find it in two groups of organisms that are related only very distantly. Arthropods are a phylum of animals that includes all of the insects, termites, beetles, butterflies, and all the other flies, as well as the tasty crustaceans like shrimp, crabs, lobsters, and, and also arachnids, spiders, scorpions, ticks. So that's one group of chitin makers, and they use chitin as part of their exoskeleton. You may have seen these cicada exuviae on uh, a uh, walk in the woods recently. They're very common this time of year. Pretty much solid chitin, this little shell they leave behind. The other group of organisms that use chitin are the fungi. They build cell walls, kind of like plants, but instead of cellulose, they use chitin. Unlike an exoskeleton that surrounds the organism only on the outside of all the cells, a cell wall envelops each and every cell. In both cases, though, the monomer is a modified glucose molecule called N-acetylglucosamine. It has the familiar green ring plus this strange blue part. And as you can see, chitin is useful for producing a strong suturing thread.